We were supposed to read from our most recent books, which I'm doing. This is the last book in my most recent book. It's called Sestets. By and by has four other books in it too, which I'm not going to read. Unless I get through too soon, then I'll go back and read this book length poem that's in there. Someone will have to get it for me. But I'm going to read, I'm going to read until 7.30, Mark. Well, <laughs> if I go over, these are all six line poems. That's why they're called sestets. And the form, oh, this is boring. Actually, the form developed up in Montana, where we go in the summer, northwest Montana. And after I would do the dishes and take out the garbage, I'd go over to my writing place, which has no illumination. So I'd have to do something between, before the sun went down. So that was cool in June, but when you got to August, <laughs> you only had about 10 minutes, you know? So these didn't, but they started out being what I could do in, in that time. I'd like to say they got better as they went along, but, or they got shorter, but they didn't, so I'd have to work on them the next day or the next week. This is called Future Tense. All things in the end are bittersweet. An empty gaze, a little way station just beyond silence. If you can't delight in the everyday, you have no future here. And if you can, no future either. And time, black dog, will sniff you out and lick your lean cheeks and lie down beside you, warm, real close, and will not move. Jessica, this is a lousy anyway. Okay. You all know Horace lived out on a farm outside of Rome, which is all you need to know as far as this poem is concerned. This is called With Horace Sitting on the Platform Waiting for the Robert E. Lee. Seventy years and what's left? Or better still, what's gone before? A couple of lines a day or two out in the cold, and all those books, those half-baked books, sweet yeast for the yellow dust. Jose Horacio, like you I'm sane and live at the edge of things. Countryside flooded with light, sundown, the chaos of future mornings just over the ridge, but not here yet. This is called Homage to What's-His-Name. Uh, it ends up with one of his images. Ah, description of all the arts the least appreciated. Well, it's just this and it's just that, someone will point out. Exactly, it's just this and it's just that and nothing other. From landscape to unsuppressed conjunction, it's only itself. No missteps, no misreading. And what's more metaphysical than that? The world in its proper posture, on all fours, drinking the sweet water. When the horses gallop away from us, it's a good thing. There's a lot of non-New York imagery in these poems, if you <laughs> notice. Oh, oh you see, I guess they, they still have horses up at Central. God, it's so sad that what they do those horses up there. Anyhow, I all, <clears throat> excuse me. I always find it strange, though I shouldn't, how creatures don't care for us the way we care for them. Horses, for instance, and chipmunks, and any bird you'd name. Empathy's only a one-way street. And that's all right, I've come to believe. It sets us up for ultimate things, and penultimate ones as well. 
it's a good listen it's a good lesson to have in your pocket when the call comes to call I always get mixed up when I use the word penultimate I swore I'd never use it again I don't know how it got in there <laughs> we hope that love calls us but sometimes we're not so sure no wind sighs and rain splatter heaves up over the mountains and dies out. October humidity like a heart red tower light, now bright, now not so bright. Autumn night at the end of the world, in its innermost corridors all damp and all light are gone, and love too. Amber does not remember the pine. Whatever the hell that means. <laughs> and this is the last of these. I'm reading too fast, Mark. I'm not going to get there. Okay, we'll see. Like the new moon, my mother drifts through the night sky. Beyond the boundaries of light and dark, my mother's gone out and not come back. Suddenly now in my backyard, like the slip moon, she rises and rests in my watching eye. In my dreams, she's returned just like this over a hundred times. She knows what I'm looking for, partially her, partially what she comes back not to tell me. I'm going to leave these up here for you in case you need to mark your place. They're right down here. Yeah, no, you can go on the other side. And then I'd like to read... What do they always say? More recent work. <laughs> the last work. This is called Sentences 2. Last chapter, last verse, everything's brown now in the golden field. The threshing floor of the past is past. The over-mountain men of the future lie cusped in their little boxes. The sun backs down over the ridge line at five after seven. The landscape puts on its black mask and settles into its sleeplessness. The fish will transpose it half for themselves, half for the water 10,000 miles away at the end of the darkening stream. To live a pure life, to live a true life, is to live the life of an insect. I mean, that is a good thing. This is called Heaven's Eel. A slight wrinkle on the pond, small wind, a small wind in the crumpled clouds reflection, ho-hum. What's needed is something under the pond's skin, something we can't see that controls all the things that we do see, something long and slithery, something we can't begin to comprehend, a future we're all engendered for, sharp teeth, Lord, such sharp teeth. Heaven's eel, heaven's eel, long and slick, full moon gone with nothing in its place. A doe is nibbling away at the long stalks of the natural world across the creek. It's good to be here. It's good to be where the world's quiescent and reminiscent. No wind blows from the far sky. Beware of prosperity, friend, and seek affection. The eel's world is not your world, but will be soon enough. This is called, I gotta slow down. Ducks. Gasoline smell on my hands, perfume from the generator's toothless mouth. Opening swallow from the green hose, sweet odor from the actual world. There's an old Buddhist saying I think I read one time, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. The ducks who neither chop nor carry understand this, as I never will. 
their little feet propelling them under the water, serene and stabilized from the far side of the pond back to the marsh grasses and cattails. I watch them every night they're there, serenitas. I watch them. Acceptance of what supports you, acceptance of what's above your body, invisible carry and chop, dark understory of desire where we should live, not in the thrashing, dust-tipped branches. Desire is anonymous, motoring hard, unswaying in the unseeable. They taught us at Iowa never to use an abstract word like unseeable. But that was 51 years ago. I don't think it makes any difference now. That's what you do. You go to graduate school and you learn all this stuff and you spend the rest of your life getting rid of it and doing what you're supposed to do or want to do. Still, it's, it's fun. Play cards above the bar. This is called Grace Two which presupposes, of course, a grace one, which I wrote 40 years ago. It's true, the aspirations of youth burn down to char strips with the years. Tonight, only memories are my company and my grace. How nice if they could outlive us, but they can't or won't. No Indian summer for us. It's rough and it's getting dark the sunset pulling the full moon up by its long fingernails. It's better this way. The unforgiven are pure, as are the unremembered. It's called Road Warriors. My traveling clothes light up the noon. I've been on my way for a long time back to the past, that irreconcilable city. Everyone wants to join me, it seems, and I let them. Roadside flowers drive me to distraction. Dragonflies hover like lapis lazuli, there, just out of reach. Narrow road, wide road, all of us on it, unhappy, unsettled, seven yards short of immortality and a yard short of not long to live. Better to sit down in the tall grass and watch the clouds to lift our faces up to the sky, considering for most of us, our lives have been one constant mistake. Well, I may have to come back to these if I finish too soon. This is called Shadow and Smoke. Now this first line I read was con it was contributed to Che Guevara, but then I read somewhere else that someone else said it. Probably hundreds of people have said it, and I just came across it, you know, the day before yesterday. Um, Live your life as though you are already dead, Che Guevara declared. Okay, let's see how that works. Not much difference as far as I can see. The earth, the same paradise it's always wanted to be. Heaven as far away as before, the clouds the same old movable gate since time began. There is no circle. There is no sentiment to be broken. There are only the songs of young men and the songs of old men hoping for something elsewise. Disabuse them in their ignorance, Lord. Tell them the shadows are already gone, the smoke already cleared. Tell them that light is never a metaphor. Why do I want to read this? This is called Four Dog Nights. Obviously stolen from the song, Three Dog Nights, by whom I can't remember. Anyhow. Sunset and dying light. The robin dark warrior in his green domain. Beyond West Virginia, the horses are putting their night shoes on, ready to break through. On the stones of the imagination, their sparks are like stars. This is the stepchild hour, belonging to neither the light or dark, the hour of disappearing things. 
I've made my tentative statement under the threatening sky. Honeysuckle in deep distress along the snow-slugged hedgerow. Eschatology is the under art of the gods. Patches of bull clover in the high desert landscape. Installed, but never instilled. The bright, shining mirage our hearts are bedeviled to. Time, great eraser. This is called October Mon Amour. It is dedicated to an old friend of mine that I met in the army in 1959 in Italy named George Schneeman, who was a painter and who lived over here on St. Mark's Place for many, many years and died just a, uh, a couple of years ago. The first dead leaves lie like sea urchins browned on the asphalt drive. It's got to be October, slayer of living things, refrigerator of memory. Next to the wilted lettuce, next to the Simon Vey, our lives are shoved in, barely visible, but still unspoiled. Our history is the history of the city of God. What's to come is anybody's guess. Whatever has given you comfort, whatever has rested you, whatever untwisted your heart, is what you will leave behind. And there's two more. I'll try to drag them out so I can make 20 minutes. If not, you have to read extra, which I know will be a great distress to you. Just a closer walk with thee. But not too close, man. Just not too close. Between the divine and the divine lies a lavish shadow. Do we avoid it or stand in it? Do we gather the darkness around us or do we let it slide by? Better to take it into our hearts. Better to let us have it. Better to let us be what we should be. Tonight, the sexual energy of the evergreens removes us from any such attitude, at least for a momentary intake. And then it's back in its natural self between the it and the it. The fly that won't leave the corpse will end up in the grave. And the last one is called History is a Burning Chariot. Oh, it started out when I was walking over to this cabin place, and it was really a beautiful evening. I said, ah, it is a beauteous evening, calm and free. And I said, well, that's what Worthy Word said, but I'm going to say something else. It is a good-looking evening, stomped and chained. The clouds sit like majesties in their blue chairs, as though doing their nails. The, the creek, tripartite and unreserved, sniddles along under its bald and blow-down bridges. It is a grace to be a watcher on such a scene. So balance me with these words. Have I said them before? I have. Have I said them the same way? I have. Will I say them again? Who knows what darkness snips at our hearts. I've done the full moon, I've done the half moon, and the quarter moon. I've even done the Patrick Spins moon, as seen by one of his drowned sailors. Tonight is the full moon again, and I won't watch it. These things have a starting place, and they have an ending. Render the balance, Lord. Send it back up to the beginning. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, um, some of you have heard what I'm about to read before. I'm sorry about that. I haven't written anything new. 
I tried last night, but it didn't turn out well. Um, I should say that if I thought what I'm about to read was poetry, I never would have written it. I thought I was writing prose. But then people keep talking about all of those prose poems you wrote. And they use the word poem so often that now I've begun to refer to them as poems, although I'm going to try not to tonight. I'm going to refer to them as prose pieces. And um, I'm just going to read the ones that I think will amuse you, but that I hate. <laughs> no, I, I won't do that. I wouldn't go that far. Um, Harmony in the Boudoir. After years of marriage, he stands at the foot of the bed and tells his wife that she will never know him that for everything he says, there is more that he does not say, that behind each word he utters, there is another word, and hundreds more behind that one. All those unsaid words, he says, contain his true self, which has been betrayed by the superficial self before her. So you see, he says, kicking off his slippers, I am more than what I have led you to believe I am. Oh, you silly man, says his wife. Of course you are. I find that just thinking of you having so many selves receding into nothingness is very exciting. <laughs> that you barely exist as you are couldn't please me more. <laughs> Um, clarities of the non-existent. I'm going to take off my watch because I don't want to read a second longer than Charles did. That's that one. Uh, clarities of the non-existent. To have loved the way it happens in the empty hours of late afternoon, to lean back and conceive of a journey leaving no trace of itself behind, no trace of itself, sorry. See, I'm going to interrupt myself. That's the sort of mistake I make when I'm writing and then I cross out behind. Who wants behind in a poem? <laughs> Uh, obviously, I'm not in my right mind tonight. <laughs> Let me start again. To have loved the way it happens in the empty hours of late afternoon, to lean back and conceive of a journey leaving behind no trace of itself, to look out from the house and see a figure leaning forward as if into the wind, although there is no wind, to see the hats of those in town discarded in moments of passion, scattered over the ground, although one cannot see the ground. All this in the vague yellowing light that lowers itself in the hour before dark. None of it of value except for the pleasure it gives, enlarging an instant and finally making it seem as if it were true. And years later, to come upon the same scene, the figure leaning into the same wind, the same hat scattered over the same ground that one cannot see. Dream testicles vanished vaginas. Horace, the corpse, said, I kept believing that tomorrow would come and I would get up, 
put on my socks, my boxer shorts, go to the kitchen, make myself coffee, read the paper, and call some friends. But tomorrow came and I was not in it. Instead, I found myself on a powder blue sofa in a field of bright grass that rolled on forever. How awful, said Mildred, who was not yet a corpse, but in close touch with Horace. How awful to be so far away with nothing to do and without sex to distract you. I've heard that all vaginas up there, even the most open, honest, and energetic, are shut down, and that all testicles, even the most forthright and gifted, swing dreamily among the clouds like little chandeliers. <laughs> Uh, it's not so good anymore. They were better when I wrote them. Um, clear in the September light. A man stands under a tree looking at a small house not far away. He flaps his arms as if he were a bird maybe signaling someone we cannot see. He could be yelling, but since we hear nothing, he probably is not. Now the wind sends a shiver through the tree and flattens the grass. The man falls to his knees and pounds the ground with his fists. A dog comes and sits beside him, and the man stands once again flapping his arms. What he does has nothing to do with me. His desperation is not my desperation. I do not stand under trees and look at small houses. I have no dog. The mysterious arrival of an unusual letter. It had been a long day at work and a long ride back to the small apartment where I lived. When I got there, I flicked on the light and saw on the table an envelope with my name on it. Where was the clock? Where was the calendar? The handwriting was my father's, but he had been dead for 40 years. As one might, I began to think that maybe, just maybe, he was alive, living a secret life somewhere nearby. How else to explain the envelope? To steady myself, I sat down, opened it, and pulled out the letter. Dear son, was the way it began. Dear son, and then nothing. Poem of the Spanish poet. In a hotel room somewhere in Iowa, an American poet, tired of his poems, tired of being an American poet, leans back in his chair and imagines he is a Spanish poet. <laughs> An old Spanish poet, nearing the end of his life, who walks to the Guadalquivir and watches the ships gray and ghostly in the twilight slip downstream. The little waves approaching the grassy bank where he sits whisper something he can't quite hear as they curl and fall. Now what does the Spanish poet do? He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a notebook, and writes, 
Black fly, black fly, why have you come? Is it my shirt, my new white shirt with buttons of bone? Is it my suit, my dark blue suit? Is it because I lie here alone under a willow cold as stone? Black fly, black fly, how good you are to come to me now. How good you are to visit me here. Black fly, black fly, to wish me goodbye. Was that? Um, once upon a cold November morning, I left the sunlit fields of my daily life and went down into the hollow mountain. And there I discovered, in all its chilly glory, the glass castle of my other life. I could see right through it and beyond, but what could I do with it? It was perfect, irreducible, and worthless except for the fact that it existed. The emergency room at dusk. The retired commander was upset. His room in the castle was cold. So was the room across the hall and all the other rooms as well. He should never have bought this castle when there were so many other cheaper, warmer castles for sale. But he liked the way this one looked, its stone turrets rising into the winter air, its main gate, even its frozen moat on which he thought someday he might ice skate, had a silvery charm. He poured himself a brandy and lit a cigar and tried to concentrate on other things. His many victories, the bravery of his men. But his thoughts swirled in tiny eddies, settling first here, then there, moving as the wind does from empty town to empty town. You left a lot of paper here for me, Charles, but no water. <laughs> it's all right. Oh, there it is. Thank you, George. George is my servant. <laughs> you get a raise. <laughs> Provisional eternity. A man and a woman lay in bed. Just one more time, said the man. Just one more time. Why do you keep saying that, said the woman. Because I never wanted to end, said the man. What don't you want to end, said the woman. This, said the man this never wanting it to end. An event about which no more need be said. <laughs> I was riding downtown in a cab with a prince who had consented to be interviewed but asked that I not mention him or his country by name. He explained that both exist secretly and their business is carried on in silence. He was tall, had a long nose beneath which was tucked a tiny mustache. He wore a pale blue shirt open at the neck and cream colored pants. I have no hobbies, he explained. My one interest is sex. It can be with a man or a woman old or young, so long as it produces the desired result, which is to remind me of the odor of white truffles 
or the taste of candied violets in a floating island. Here, let me show you something. When I saw it, saw how big it was and what he'd done to it, I screamed and leaped from the moving cab. <laughs> A short panegyric. Now that the vegetarian nightmare is over <laughs> and we are back to our diet of meat and deep in the sway of our dark and beautiful habits and able to speak with calm of having survived, let the breeze of the future touch and retouch our large and hungering bodies. Let us march to market to embrace the butcher and put the year of the carrot, the month of the onion behind us. <laughs> Let us worship the roast or the stew that takes its place once again at the sacred center of the dining room table. Oh, it's here. Just a few more. Um, uh, mystery and solitude in Topeka. Afternoon darkens into evening. A man falls deeper and deeper into the slow spiral of sleep, into the drift of it, the length of it, through what feels like mist and comes at last to an open door through which he passes without knowing why, then again without knowing why, goes to a room where he sits and waits while the room seems to close around him and the dark is darker than any he has known and he feels something forming within him without being sure what it is its hold on him growing as if a story were about to unfold in which two characters pleasure and pain commit the same crime the one that is his that he will confess to again and again until it means nothing in the afterlife. She stood beside me for years, or was it a moment? I cannot remember. Maybe I loved her, maybe I didn't. There was a house and then no house. There were trees, but none remain. When no one remembers, what is there? You whose moments are gone, who drift like smoke in the afterlife, tell me something, tell me anything. The social worker and the monkey once I sat in a room with a monkey who told me he was not a monkey. I understood his anguish being trapped in a body he detested. Sir, I said, I think I know what you are feeling and I would like to help you. Treat me like a monkey, he said, it serves me right. <laughs> I'll read two more. Those little legs and awful hands. Night had fallen. A man who was staying at the Grand Hotel walked to the beach, lit a cigar, opened a black umbrella and leaned back in a canvas beach chair holding the cigar in one hand and the umbrella in the other. I wanted to ask him, why the umbrella? But I was too timid. Then I heard him say, those little legs and awful hands, will I never be rid of them? 
I patted my legs, then looked at my hands, and knew that he had not meant me, and certainly not himself, but maybe another, someone he might have hated or even loved. But down the beach, a woman wearing very large mittens <laughs> was coming toward him rapidly with baby steps. He jumped up from the beach chair, tossed his cigar, and with his umbrella began to run. He ran and ran, trying to escape, as if he could ever escape. And my last poem, <clears throat> a poem, see I said poem, I mean my last prose piece. <laughs> this, <clears throat> this is called A Letter from Tegucigalpa and explains what's happened to me in my writing life. The slow spiral into nothingness. That's not part of the poem, this is... <laughs> Let me start again. A letter from Tegucigalpa. Dear Henrietta, since you were kind enough to ask why I no longer write, I shall do my best to answer you. In the old days, my thoughts, like tiny sparks, would flare up in the almost dark of consciousness, and I would transcribe them, and page after page shone with a light that I called my own. I would sit at my desk amazed by what had just happened, and even as I watched the lights fade and my thoughts become small, meaningless memorials in the afterglow of so much promise, I was still amazed. And when they disappeared as they inevitably did, I was ready to begin again, ready to sit in the dark for hours and wait for even a single spark, though I knew it would shed almost no light at all. What I had not realized then, but now know only too well, is that sparks carry within them the wish to be relieved of the burden of brightness. And that is why I no longer write, and why the dark is my freedom and my happiness. Thank you. Okay, how about questions from the audience? Oh. <laughs> you have one too. Hang on, one too. I have one. Okay, oh. let's turn it on. Well, how are you? I'm fine. Oh, good. Yeah, you read pretty well tonight. I love what you read. I love what you read too, but I'd already read it before. That's the way people stay friends. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Forever and ever. Um, no, anybody have any questions? We can talk about the old days in Iowa City, or we can talk about why Charles continues to write and why I don't. Well, Charles has that's, many more ideas than I have. Yeah, that's bullshit, you know it. Uh, I haven't written in two years until this summer, and then I went crazy. And wrote a lot of bad stuff, but it doesn't matter if it's bad or not. Oh, well, no, but it's good. Oh, well, thank you, Mark. <laughs> I want to know, is there anybody here older than we are? And I don't think so. So we can say whatever the hell we want to, can't we? Yeah. That's, that's good. Okay. And uh, we can say it and get away with it. That's what I mean. Uh, what do you want to say, <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that I do love those prose pieces. Oh, thank you. I, I, uh, I, I like them. I had fun writing them. I should, well, I'll talk a little about uh, myself or what was myself. Uh, 
when I was writing the prose pieces, but of course I'm entirely different now. <laughs> so many changes. Oh, man, my hair is getting red again, and you know, I'm getting shorter. But um, I, I had so much fun writing the prose pieces, uh, the kind of fun I never really had writing poetry. Um, well, I did when I first started writing poetry. It was a lot of fun because the poems came easily. But then as the years went on, they didn't come so easily. And, and when they don't come easily, you begin to wonder, am I really a poet? Because poets should be able to write poems. And I would have these periods of two or three years when I didn't write a poem. And this caused a degree of anxiety in me so that whenever I did sit down to write a poem, there was an enormous amount of pressure on me to succeed in the writing of the poem. And I would feel that I was on to something some of the time, but after I would be, would be writing for a while, I'd begin to see the limitations of what I was writing and lose heart. Sometimes I was able to sustain the illusion that this was a valuable poem that I was writing. Um, I mean, all of this is simply to say that the writing of the prose pieces, because I thought they were prose, still believe they're prose, um, liberated me from the kind of pressure I felt writing poetry. And um, it also allowed me to be funnier, because I think I'm terribly funny, <laughs> allowed me to be funnier than I would allow myself to be in a poem, because I always thought poetry was a serious business. Well, I shouldn't say business, because you don't make any money from poetry. I mean, if it's a business, it's a bad business. Um, so, I did that, and but the difference is the prose pieces don't have the weight. They don't have the, the words don't have the specific gravity. They don't, there's a lightness about that book. Uh, I mean, I wish it were more leaden and heavier. In other words, I wish there was more poetry in it, but mainly it's fable and joke and, uh, but, I mean, some of them are funny. I mean, um, well, anyway, I don't want to, uh, because I want you to buy the book. Uh, some of you have probably already bought it. I don't want you to feel disappointed or want your money back. Because even though I say that about the book, it is a totally brilliant effort. <laughs> um, I mean, no one else could have done it. <laughs> That's true. You know, well, nobody else would probably want to do no, it. But uh, anyhow, that's the story of my writing life. Now, Charles, tell us the story of your writing life. That's not fair, Stan. <laughs> um, well, I can't write prose, so I don't have the escape that Mark has, you know. And I don't, I can't paint, I can't, I used to play golf. Oh, well, you're good. I was good, but I'm not anymore. Uh, so poems are the only thing I have. And since they don't tell stories, they're mostly meditations about what I want to think is going on in my head and in my life at any given time. And so I write that down. And since my life has gone on, fortunately, for low these many years, I've never not been able to do it. Um, sometimes better than others. There was always a sense of urgency though, you know, about writing poems, about trying to get said what you felt should be said about things and yourself and your relation to them and your relation to what is there and is not there. And the urgency always held sway. Sometime around the age of 75, two years ago, 
the urgency took a hike. And uh, and that's okay, you know, that's all right. Jesus, I mean, I, um, but urgency is really important in writing poems, to feel that you have to write them. And if you don't feel you have to write them, then don't write them. You know, there seems to be no reason to write them if you don't have to or want to. I mean, God, there are plenty of other people out there doing it. You know, you can't walk down the street without being hit with 15 poems, you know, on, even on the cross streets, you know. And uh, I didn't have a great urgency. And I, uh, and po <coughs> Seamus Heaney, just to drop a name, I read about it in a book once, said, and it's very true, you know, that poems should not come out of habit, but out of necessity. And after a certain period of time, after you said one of the four or five things that you probably have to say in your life, and you said them five or six different ways over 40 years, you ought to as my wife says of some people, lay your pen aside, you know? You ought to shut up. And uh, I think that's true. But, hmm? <laughs> yes, you did. I didn't say it about you. No, you didn't say it about me. I won't tell them who you said it about. <laughs> but they're friends of mine, of course. <laughs> no, not Strand, no. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you. No, I won't tell you. Uh, where was I? Uh, but then, then this summer I, 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 I picked it back up again after a year and a half, and, uh, or two years actually, and wrote the Apocrypha to my last book, which has just been finished. And I'm sort of like Mark. I, I don't know that I'll ever write a poem again, but then I can't write essays. I can't write short stories. I can't even write letters anymore because it bores me to death to write letters. I used to write them all the time. So that leaves me pretty much high and dry, you know? But uh, I'm sitting on top of my 50 published books and so the water can stay down there. It's okay. No, we started out, when we started out, we, you know, it was fun. You know, we used to take your poems into the bar every night and show them to everybody as if everybody cared about them. But you cared about what they said. And then after a while, after about 20 years, I never showed them to anybody ever again. Even my publisher wouldn't look at them. He just put them in covers and said, okay, greatest publisher who ever lived. And uh, I'm just going on because I'm supposed to be talking. Yeah, if I, well. I like listening to you, Joe, but see, I think you could write something else. Well, I probably could, but I won't because I'm lazy. Well, there's the other thing. There's the other thing. <laughs> I mean, we are lazy, I'm lazy, and now I know that you may be lazy in the future. That's true, and I've made so much money off of poetry that I can afford not to do it, you know? <laughs> well, I'm with you there. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, did you want to ask a question? <laughs> well, um, let's say, this is to both of you. Yeah. If you decided you were not becoming a poet, what else would you do in life? What well, was your first choice? If you well, that's very interesting. I, everybody always says, well, at an early age, I had this great ambition to do this and to do that and to do that. I had no ambition in my life whatsoever except the next beer and the next girl. You know, that's all I cared about in the next golf game. I mean, that's really all I had. And it wasn't until I was 23 years old and I was in the army and I was over in Italy and I read this poem. I'd always sort of wanted to write, but that's not wanting to do anything, you know. And I read this poem and it, uh, it really got to me. So I said, well, maybe I could do something like that. It wasn't narrative. And it was beautiful. And I found out only years later it was a Niambic pentameter, which is why it sounded so good. Uh, and so I tried imitating that. And that's how I got going into this. And so I never had any thought, although I was going to be a journalist, actually, to get out of the Army early 
I applied to the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism uptown. And lo and behold, I got in. And I figured out later the reason I got in was because my faculty advisor at Davidson College, where I'd gone to college, was the college roommate of the, of the dean of the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, and he had written me a recommendation. So you figure it out. You know, uh, I did spend three months working on the Kingsport Times News after my <laughs> high school <laughs> was over. I had no idea. I didn't know I wouldn't do anything. But I really got caught by the throat with poetry. And, and it was fortunate because it was something that I could write since I didn't have to tell a story. You know, Southern, Southerners are supposed to be able to tell a story. I can't tell a story. My father couldn't tell a story. My brother can't tell a story. <laughs> My mother couldn't tell a story. Actually, I don't know nobody in my in my family could tell a story. So I never heard them. Everybody always talks about, well, I heard all this stuff going on in my family. I thought, Dude, I've got to do that too. So there I was floating around in the army, having the time of my life uh, in Italy, which had blown me away because I came from the hills of East Tennessee and never seen anything except a postcard before, and uh, it was great. And so. Um, then I, uh, <laughs> I got into the famous writer's workshop at the University of Iowa because I, and I turned my manuscript in in August for September acceptance. And I got accepted into the graduate school because I had to be, be average in college and it was okay. And so I went there. And the first word out of the first person's mouth was Dr. Strand, and he said, the first poem on the worksheet, I don't think the iambic pentameter is working very well in this poem. <laughs> Strand was pissing on the post. He was, he was establishing himself, which he did immediately. <laughs> and I said, I'm dead meat. I don't know what iambic pentameter is. And then later I found out the reason I got in was because I didn't get in. Nobody read my manuscript. They just sent my thing over from the graduate school, and there I was floating around again. And uh, so I attached myself to Strand and learned a few things. <laughs> well, I mean, that... Uh, it's true. That's, that's the way all that stuff works. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I wanted to be a painter, but then I went to art school, and everybody there seemed to have much more talent than I had and um, but I read you know poetry and I established myself as a loudmouth um, I would talk about you know the I mean you know and the teacher would talk about our paintings and I would say, well, Hazlitt talks about gusto in these terms, you know. And the, the poor professor didn't know what to make of that. Uh, and, but, I, I mean, I was a pretentious little twit. Big twit. twit tall. And uh, a show-off. And uh, all because I realized deep down I just didn't have that much talent. I had to do something to be present. And I made a kind of pain in the ass of myself. Um, but then I, I really loved what some of my fellow students were doing. And so after my first year, I just uh, settled for peaceful anonymity, a kind of narcosis of the spirit. I kind of slept through the last couple of years of art school and then I then went to Italy on a Fulbright but in literature. And I started uh, writing there, really, and um, um, I woke up when I was 40 and 
I realized I couldn't be a waiter in a restaurant anymore because my feet would hurt. I had to keep writing because I could sit down and do it. And, um, and now I'm 44. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's my story, really. Yeah. This is a question initially for Mr. Strong, but I think it applies to, to Mr. Wright uh, in your procedure to, from longer to short Like, I, I've always felt there's a really strong narrative component in your, yeah. in, in your works, in your poems. And in a way, the, thing, the way I think you write them, you know, it comes from a certain idea that you start developing into that depth that you were a bit talking about uh, a minute before. Yeah. I feel in a way, and I would like you to ask if it's not the case, that uh, your recent works are showing a bit of the procedure, a bit of the moment before what you do, what you change these ideas into poems. In the way that from the joyful moment of the creation of the idea towards the yeah. Of the well, another way of putting that would be that they're not finished poems. <laughs> <laughs> but they're finished prose. But they're finished prose. Yeah. As a, as yeah. Something well, I finish a poem, you lose. Let's yeah. Like this that, yeah, that's very well put. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's easier to write these because I don't have to finish. I don't have to carry them to the next stage. Although a few of them were. Uh, written from rough drafts I had of poems that I knew I couldn't finish. So I merely used those uh, rough drafts of poems that I had around for years in some cases and just wrote them as prose in a paragraph and I could live with that because my expectations for prose aren't what they are for poetry. Simple as that. Well, let me interject just to, just a second, and this is not, you know, because Mark is my friend, or we're up and all this. Stuff. But there is a there is a little darkness running under all of these prose pieces, like a little stream running, and you shouldn't discount that. Yes, they're funny. Yes, they are sometimes cute. Yes, they're sometimes amazingly funny and gross at the same time. Uh, I think of whatever he showed you in the tab. But there is a seriousness under all of these things that you shouldn't discount. And uh, there is a seriousness, of course, in his poems and a seriousness, if not over-seriousness, in mine. So I, I, from that point of view, don't discount this in, in almost invisible. No, no, I, my next book is going to be long gone, you know. It's going to be what? Long gone. Oh, I thought it might be invisible. No. Like mine. I'm not coming be. back. But I think both of us, we're both valedictory poets. Mm -hmm. I think we're both, we've been waving goodbye for a while, Charles. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since 1963, <laughs> when Jessica was born. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh. Yes, a question for Mark. Uh, when you looked at a poem and you felt it had value, what made you feel that way about a poem? What was the value? Oh, oh, that's a hard question. I mean, I could be, I don't want to be um, supercilious. No, I mean, it's not because I would end up being very sorry and it wouldn't be what I really want to say. Um, are, do you mean my poems or anybody's poems? Your poems. I think they wanted a certain magic, a certain element that you could you feel you could feel was there, but you couldn't really put your finger on it that the poem had a life that was present, but at the same time unreachable. That it existed in this world, but had a foot in the other world, whatever that other world is. That there was something in the poem that drew you into another level of knowledge, but you didn't quite know what that was. Or that you didn't know that you knew it. 
or you, you didn't know that you knew it. I think that's one of the things about writing is you write and then you wonder, did I write that? And is that, wow, I didn't know I could say that. Or, you know, some, when you write, you don't write necessarily following the uh, kind of, um, you sometimes follow simply formal imperatives. You feel the rightness of what you're doing, even the, though you don't understand it, and you really can't paraphrase it. You just feel the weight of it. You feel its presence. I think yeah. that's something like that. Yeah, I, th I, th I feel the same way, you know. I've, that magic, which you say is magic, is it's the same thing to me, but it's also a point, an entrance point into something beyond what I'm able to say. And to get to it in the most interesting way that I can, and the most Im imagistically satisfying is what I'm always trying to do, is to get to that point, uh, that still point that's beyond what I, I hope is beyond what I know and where I'll never see, but uh, I like to know it's, that I'm looking for it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. When I read your prose pieces, yeah. all of them, uh, I was also wondering whether they would lean towards poetry or towards prose, and I left the decision. I left the decision to you. And today, when you read, I thought you were reading poetry because there was one very strong element of rhythm. So uh, I think it's poetry. Well, I mean, if you've been writing poetry for 50 years, it's hard to shake it, you know? I mean, uh, my prose is rhythmical because, I mean, that's the way I think, you know? I, I, uh, I can't help it, uh, but, uh, yeah, oh well. It's also in the way you read it, because you read it the way you read your poems, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, the difference between Mr. and Mrs. Baby and Almost Invisible the prose yeah. is quite striking, and that these pieces are short, which gives them give themselves to the idea that the compression is a poetic compression, uh, is there, you know. But I've known Mark a long time, and these are prose pieces. Even that, no matter how he reads them, they are prose pieces. Except the one about the Spanish poet, which is a poem. <laughs> well, there is a poem in that, but you know, interestingly enough. I wanted to write something that sounded like a translation of Lorca, you know. But I can't read that poem in Spain because in Spanish it just seems like a lousy poem. <laughs> <laughs> well, the horrors of translation. One more question. Okay, one more. Yes. I, I was just wondering when you were in Iowa, was it when Paul Engel was doing the workshop? Yeah, he was he was the king. Well, he uh, he ran it out of his back pocket. I mean, he raised all the money that he used to get the talented people there. Those of us just out of the army after three years had a lot of money, so we paid our way. Uh, but Paul would go over to Cedar Rapids. My son called it Cedar Rapids. Rabbits. And I, and I can't stop saying Cedar Rabbits. Cedar Rapids and go to the Quaker Oats Company and, and get money for this. You know, this is un un unbelievable. But Paul didn't really run the workshops. Donald Justice ran the workshops. Paul would come in from time to time, but he was too busy making money, keeping the thing afloat. Although he did establish the International Workshop, which was which is a big thing, you know, it was, it was, it was a big deal. But, uh, I don't know. Well, we both came from Italy at the same time, the fall of 1961. No, 61. 61. And that was my first attraction because I was so smitten with Italy and I knew Mark had just been there. I introduced myself and you know, I had that other thing and I knew I had a lot to learn and I kept my mouth shut for two years and learned something, you know. Not enough, but I learned something. And how many students were there in those days? 
about 40. Well, there were, I think there were 30 poets and 30 fiction writers. Yeah. And now there's 60 of each. Yeah, in a barracks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was simple in those days. Now yeah. it's become a conglomerate. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. Well, we all live for poetry, and we mm -hmm. all uh, we were drinking the same bars and play pinball and play cards and and uh, throw knives at the wall. Yeah. And we all talked about poetry all the time. Something we don't do anymore. That's all we talked about was poetry. You know, you do. That's all you live for, which is great. I don't, I'm I'm sure they still do it. And I'm sure they don't know that it's an overinflated. No, it's still a great place, you know. It's very good. They still get all, not all, but most of the good students because everybody wants to go there, you know. And because it's so. Those are the good old days. Yeah, Mark and I made it so famous. That they <laughs>